Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I'm obviously very lucky to uh, have the man here with us today. Uh, there is no fire, unfortunately, because we felt there was a health and safety issue. They could put um, a video of a fire, please, here. Yeah, it would be a good idea. Apparently Ford's did that, so it's, 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 we'll tell the organisers. Um, Iman, uh, you've had a very interesting life so far. Okay, So it, it began in Morocco, uh, and you left there as a teenager to go to uh, the US. Um, how was that transition for you, to actually go uh, from a place you knew so well in, into the midst of the United States of America? It definitely was not an easy process for me, especially as a teenager. I think you're going through puberty and all your hormones are kicking in, and I think at the time um, I hadn't spoken any English at all. I actually failed English in Morocco, so that was not a good sign when I first landed in America. And also, we have never really been to the U.S. growing up, so it was a completely foreign culture. It was a foreign language. Just I had to almost start over at 15 years old. So it definitely was an easy process. I actually went through mild depression uh, for the first year, and it wasn't until I went back to Morocco and got my closure and finally just accepted the fact that this is our new lives now. And also seeing my parents uh, sacrifice a lot more than I did, um, you know, their jobs, their career, their families, to really bring us to the U.S. for the American dream and for better opportunities and uh, a better education, I think it just really put it all in perspective and now in retrospect, I think it's the best you know decision they've ever made. It's also left you with uh, what, four or five languages, I understand? You speak. Three, technically, my Spanish isn't that great anymore. I don't practice it anymore. <laughs> I guess that can help with the entrepreneurial uh, yeah. venture that you're on now. Um, so, so after some years you became a biochemist um, and how was how was that for you? I mean, like, was that a, was that a long term thing? So, and then after this, you move into the, the beauty queen years, we could say. Um, in in those uh, initial years, what took you from something like biochemistry into the, the world of beauty queen? Well, I, I think so. When I when we moved to the U.S. shortly after uh, my godmother was diagnosed with breast cancer, and she ended up passing away from that. And it wasn't, um, you know, a case where it, it was completely could have been prevented. So I think it affected me a lot, knowing that she raised me alongside with my parents, and I wasn't able to do anything. I think that was kind of the driving force behind me um, wanting to go to medical school eventually, or at some sort of getting involved with cancer research, which eventually I ended up doing. Um, so I went to school for biochemistry and molecular biology, and then. I uh, went on to uh, grad school for bioengineering after a short internship in, in Germany, which really made me discover the R&D side of biotech. So I wanted to go to medical school at first, and then after my internship, I really fell in love with the, the biotech industrial aspect of it and the research um, aspect of that. So I came back and went to school for bioengineering and ended up landing a um, position at a startup in Colorado as the lead scientist when it comes to cancer research, specifically focused on melanoma and carcinoma. Um, and, you know, and, and we, I, during that time, I also started taking on medical missions around the world because ultimately my goal was, okay, I wasn't able to do anything for my godmother, but the point is I had this opportunity to study uh, in the U.S. and have this great education and bigger opportunities. I want to ultimately go back to Morocco and be able to give back to my community there. And so medical missions were kind of my way of doing that. My first one was to South Sudan, which was not, at the time, it was going through the civil war. So the UN a actually, bit of <laughs> yeah, so I actually thought that's, you know, it was over for me and we had to uh, get saved by the UN. And, but it was truly, I think, a, an eye-opening experience. It broadened my perspective and really showed me a different side of the world. Um, and then ultimately I went back to uh, Ecuador and I led a, a medical mission to Morocco, specifically to my dad's region. So my medical missions were for me a way to, um, in a way, test out the career and see if it is for me. And then also a way to give back because I felt so strongly about not being able to help my godmother at the time. And, and so during this time, my mother actually, um, signed me off on my first beauty pageant in Colorado because she wanted me to be pushed out of my comfort zone and try something new, find a new hobby, um, and then also be a little bit more girly. <laughs> I grew up as a tomboy, so this was her way of slightly telling me that I needed to 
try something new. And that was an interesting experience too because I, I never really thought of myself as someone that um, could come up on stage and just be poised or gracious, especially not as a beauty pageant queen, is, is what they call it. And that really, I think, is what made me the woman I am today. It has taught me so much about myself and has introduced me to this concept of self-awareness. And so ultimately, I think it was a combination between the, my science life and research and medical missions combined with the, the beauty queen experience that led me to where I'm at today. So, so it, was, it was 2015, you won Miss New York and played runner-up or first runner-up in Miss USA. Incredible, well done. Um, you were saying uh, when we spoke before that there was actually a lot of learnings from that experience into your entrepreneurial adventures where you are now. What, what were they? Well, I think the biggest skill that you learn as a pageant contestant is being able to sell yourself. In, in a matter of two minutes, you have to convince the judges that you're the best person to win the title and to represent the state or the nation. So I learned a lot about communication and just being very... Um, uh, and putting over my, my stage phobia at the time, there was no way I could have ever gotten on stage beforehand because it was just so scary for me and that pushed me yeah, outside of my comfort zone and was able to learn that and, and think quick on my feet. So I think that's why you see a lot of former beauty pageant contestants become news anchors or run for office or lead you know, companies or whatnot it's because the training part of pageantry is really the most, I think, impactful. It's not even about winning the title, it's just the process that you go through to even get on that stage is, is what really I think is not highlighted enough in the media, which is why again people have a different perception about pageants and they think it's quite shallow and it's just about beauty, but it's a lot more than that. And so those skills really helped me as an entrepreneur when pitching investors, when selling my vision, when talking about my mission. I don't think that I would have been able to be comfortable with that if it wasn't for my pageant experience. Awesome. So I think that concept of changing perceptions has followed you now in, into your career as, as founder of Sway. Um, could you first explain to the audience, I'm sure they're interested, about what Sway is about um, and also maybe talk a little bit about your future uh, product release that's coming soon. Yeah, so in 2015, uh, shortly after winning the title of Miss New York, I launched a podcast called Entrepreneurs in Vogue at the time. And my goal with that um, as a hobby was to find interesting female stories, especially on the, in the leadership uh, forefront, and tell those stories and highlight them. And just it was a way for me to connect with women that led a different type of lifestyle and an unconventional path to success because I felt like they weren't highlighted enough in the media. Um, and shortly after launching the podcast, it was number two on iTunes, so I think that really showed me that there is hunger and need for this kind of content, especially for the modern woman right now to feel represented in the media. And so the more I looked into it, the more I saw the, the big disconnect between how media depicts and portrays women and the reality of who we are. And there's also a big lack of female voices in the media. So about 63% of bylines and op-eds in the US and the top media outlets in the US still come from men, even when it comes to female-focused issues. And a lot of female columnists and op opinion writers um, claim that that space and the op-ed pages are still dominated by men for different reasons. Obviously one is sexism, two is resistance to change, and three, the reluctance of women to lend their voice and actually be part of those conversations because they fear being judged or attacked for their opinions. So with Sway, uh, you know, when I first launched it, I wanted it to kind of fill the gap between the business publications and the lifestyle publications because lifestyle publications were mostly female focused, but they focused on content that is uh, soft lifestyle topics, fashion, beauty, nothing really substantive. But then you have the business publication, they were obviously focused on smart content that brought value, but they necessarily didn't cater to women in the way they look, the, the tone of the voice, and whatnot. So Sway was a little bit of a between, a Forbes meets Vogue, if you will, that's how we referred to it at the beginning. And as we progressed in the past three years, we saw that um, Women were also looking for more than just content provider, but also a platform where their voice is heard. So with Sway 2.0 that's launching in two weeks, 
we kind of went back and pivoted a little bit and introduced different features that make the platform more interactive. So not only do we focus on providing women with inspiring and substantive content, but we also give them a platform where they can lend their voice to be part of these conversations. Um, so I'm an entrepreneur as well, um, and I've had uh, I've experienced the difficulties attached to that now. Uh, I can see from colleagues that, that being a, a woman in entrepreneurship is just extra difficult um, through issues connected to financing and also perhaps a lack of role models. How, is, how have you experienced that and, and, and do you see any changes happening in terms of the financing landscape for women and indeed uh, is it getting easier for women to get involved? Are they seeing more role models and references? Well, I, I definitely think that it's changing for the better, um, thankfully, and, and a big part of that is because we're talking about it more. And, and before that, no one was, I think it was a taboo topic that we didn't really want to be accused of playing the woman card. Um, but the more studies focused on this um, and the more research came out, the more we saw power in the numbers. I mean, 2% of VC money last year in 2018 went to women, even though women own 38% of the businesses. Um, and then on the VC side, 74% of firms in the US um, still don't have any female at all investors. So I think it's definitely um, harder for women to land um, funding because of lack of you know, mentorship, resources, um, access to the boys club where the money is. Um, and also I think uh, there isn't enough diversity at the top when it comes to VCs. Now, there's also another study that HBR, um, Harvard Business Review, recently published about um, their analysis of the video transcripts um, of Q&A sessions that were happening between startups and VCs. And what they, found is that, what they found is that VCs tend to ask different types of questions to male entrepreneurs versus female entrepreneurs. So when it comes to men, they ask them more about the potential for gains. But when it comes to women, they ask them about the potential for losses. So you can see how that affects the way, not only if, if we want to fund women, but also how much money are we giving them. So in that study, the male-led startups ended up giving or getting uh, five times more funding than the women startups in the study. So I think now you see the biggest issue here is really how do we approach and evaluate women businesses versus men businesses and it's time to really approach them in a fair way but a lot of this is also bias and unconscious bias so even when it comes to female VCs they still make that mistake so it's not necessarily a male male woman dynamic so, so it's work in progress uh, if we were to evaluate the numbers we could see that women are actually more successful when they, they in, in, are invested in but it's taking its time. You mentioned to me before when we had a chat that um, uh, when women invest, because you have a lot of uh, women supporters on, on the website, including Cindy Gallup, um, there's also perhaps an issue in women themselves investing, uh, perhaps a risk averseness. Is this something that's real and is, is it changing at all? I think it's changing. We're seeing more female focused funds uh, emerging, which is a great help. I don't think it's the only solution. I don't think that it's fair for women to only be pitching women. Um, but I think when it comes to women, sometimes they do cut smaller checks. Uh, I think there's a, we talk about the gender pay gap, but there's also a gender investment gap. And I think more women now are starting to learn how to invest money, but they're not completely there yet. And that's why. I always say that the solution is not to only pitch women or launch more female-focused funds. I just think that it's more of a public conversation that involves men and women about gender power and dynamics. Okay, so I really wish you success with the future business. This was my final question before we go to the audience because I want to make sure that, that they get their, their chance. Um, where do you see your best opportunities in terms of markets? Where can you, uh, where can you get sway to grow the quickest? We definitely have our eye on the Middle East. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, I think for us it's an emerging market because that's where we're seeing, we're seeing a lot more female leaders emerge out of that market, but there is a lack of platforms where they feel represented. And I have a Middle Eastern background, so I feel like it really is close, home to, to, close to home for me. And I would like to make that our next market um, when it comes to Sway. So Sway Arabia is in, um, it's in the forecast. Uh, and then the other market is, of course, Africa. I think now there are more women also emerging out of there. There's Women in Africa Leadership Forum that's happening next month. And so 
that market is starting to also celebrate and elevate more female voices in the leadership forefront. So we want to be there because we want to be that go-to platform where women feel like they can be represented and they can also lend their voice to discuss important pressing issues when it comes to women. Okay, and I think you're saying as well that the UK is actually one of your big markets by default. Yeah. Right? The UK is our, is our biggest, the second biggest market after the US, of course. Superb. So let's go to the questions here. So, um, what is your solution to business-based sexism? Well, I think first we need to be open about it um, and, and talk more about it in the media because that's really the first step to solving an issue is acknowledging that it exists. I think what I've seen is that um, a lot of people when faced with and confronted with these stats when we talk about sexism or or the gender gap, they get very aggressive or dismissive, and they think that we're just playing the woman card and claim that advancements are based on merit, you know, and experience and qualifications. But as long as we keep say, seeing that one gender is getting paid less, funded less, and represented less, there is a gender problem. So we need to all just be in agreement about this. Um, and then the sexism, I think men should be more uh, open to the conversation and be more informed about how to appropriately evaluate and talk to female founders when they're pitching you. I mean, we hear so many stories in the media, and Sway has published so many of them, and we keep getting those stories all the time about how when a female founder is pitching an investor, they're usually more focused on wanting to take her out on a date or commenting on her physical appearance. And those comments are just inappropriate and discouraging because now it's just what, for me, my, my experience, I mean, I went through that, is I just want, want to go home and cry about it. And, you know, there's no really good way of approaching that situation as a woman. So I feel like it's also men's responsibility to be open to changing their behavior when it comes to evaluating female businesses and women when pitching and out. If you look at uh, the Web Summit, for example, and other events, they, they try and actually make it, for example, cheaper for women to go to get more representation. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that, that kind of idea is, is helpful uh, to make uh, more like if, if more women can see more women at these events, there's more chance that they feel more comfortable. Yeah, but I also don't think that the solution is to offer them free tickets. And I think it just says a lot about, I mean, if, if women are not attending your event, then you're not making it cater to women. So that's the first question you should ask yourself. The solution is not, hey, here's free tickets, please just come represent more women in the events, because now we're not doing it the right way. And it's just more of a quota thing. So I think the first big question is why aren't women attending our events and how can we change that? How can we cater to women? And the, the way to change that is having women at the, at the decision tables. If you don't have a woman's perspective, um, when you're making decisions about the type of speakers you want to have or the branding of your event or any of that sort, it's not going to cater to women because you don't have a woman weighing in. So that's where it starts. It needs to have, we need to start with diversity at the top in order for us and for brands to be able to market better to women and therefore increase women's representation in these events. Okay, I should go to that and ask more questions here. Um, do you think that emancipation and gender equality has gone too far? Uh, I don't think you think that, um, but uh, maybe answer the question. Do you think that emancipation and gender equality has gone too far? No, because we're still seeing, like I said, there is, you know, a gender that's being paid less and represented less, so there is still a gender problem, and what we've just been doing recently is mostly being open about it, so I don't know that that's taken it too far, I think it's just that we're breaking the stigma around talking about these conversations, and that's a big step forward. Sure, and I'll try this one first, so what's your lifetime vision? What do you aspire to achieve in terms of, to improve gender equality? Yes, I love your passion for the subject. Thank you. Uh, well, I definitely want to see more uh, women being represented equally in the media. I, the reason why I picked media as randomly kind of my endeavor and my venture, even though I don't come from this world, is because that's really the way to influence people and that's the way to change narrative. It all starts with what people consume and the stories we tell. So for me, that's really where my passion is. I, I want to dedicate my life to increasing this representation, whether it's telling women's stories or giving them a platform to weigh in on important issues. Um, apparently people want to know, uh, do you think your appearance has helped you in your business career? It hasn't helped me very much, if I'll be honest, but uh, is outside appearance a competitive advantage in businesses? I, I never know how to answer this question. Um, but based on the comments I have personally heard and gotten, I wouldn't think it helped. Um, 
if anything, it was more of a barrier to overcome and a lot of, especially also having the beauty queen background, some people tend to assume that there is no substance there, I have no brain, even though I have degrees to prove it. And Ignore actually, the bio chemistry part. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they, that's what they, and again, I think that goes back to women have this disadvantage um, of this dynamics that emphasizes appearance and looks over achievements. And, you know, popular fantasies about women, sadly, never tend to feature intelligence, leadership, expertise, or even toughness at the negotiation table. So. It does work against me at times, but I don't really choose to focus on that. Um, and I think I just focus on proving myself and seeing that and telling people that I know what I'm talking about and showing the results that I, I've built and the traction that we've done with the business versus being so caught up on what I look like. Amen, sister. <laughs> and do men, well, do men experience any gender-specific struggles in workplace? I can tell you that we don't very much. Okay. Um, in, in man, how do you handle objections in your sales pitches? Give us an example, maybe. Objections? In, what kind of objections are we? Sales pitch, what kind of uh, example? Well, I think um, sometimes in, in the pitches, um, what we don't get, and at least I found this from experience, is concrete, real feedback about why they passed on, on the business or why they don't think it's going to be a successful business. We just get that, oh, it's not going to be and that's it. So I always try to push back and really understand what kind of feedback I can take out of that meeting and in order for us to improve. So is it the numbers, is it the traction, is it the business model? And I've been very persistent with that and I think that's really why we have pivoted to Sway 2.0 because even though I got no's and rejections and objections in meetings, I try to push back and get the real reason why. And it turns out a lot of it, especially now with the media landscape being, uh, you know, underhyped, it, it has to do with the business model. So we wanted to push for subscription and membership model versus ad base, and I think that was a big uh, reluctance of investors as to why they don't want to invest. Okay, so we've come to the end of our time. Do you want to just tell people what the website is, just to, to remind yeah. them? Well, it's sway.com with two A's, but right now it says coming soon, so we'll be launching in two weeks. Super. Thank you so much for your time. Very interesting. Thank you for Thank having you. me.